Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and another week where I hope everyone who's listening is working from home or not working at all. If you're one of those people who have a job of saving lives out there during this absolute shit show, thank you so much for all that you're doing. I wish you went into this battle better prepared. I know we are all dealing with this whole quarantine in our own ways, and a lot of them are similar. With FaceTime and Zoom calls to friends, I'm doing that too, but I'm randomly hitting up people that I haven't talked to in 20 years. I highly recommend doing this. It's pretty funny to see people's faces when they open a call to your face that they haven't seen in 20 years. At this point, I've been in the house for about 27 days, and I'm not going crazy. I'm just working way too much, and I can't complain. I know I'm lucky to have work to keep me busy. The bummer is, there really isn't too much to look forward to other than food, and the best stuff is already gone. We need to go through our frozen meats, canned stuff, and a little bit more before we can head to the home of the virus, the grocery store, and reload with the good stuff. The food part hasn't been that bad for us, but it's the little things I miss. The things that used to be my staple foods in my 20s and 30s. Soda, candy, and gum. Yeah, we're out of gum and it really sucks. Getting outside has been key for me and the family, and I need to thank my good friend and old colleague Steve Hemphill over at Baden for sending over a regulation tournament badminton set. Keaton is really into badminton, and he thinks it's a sport, not a game, because it's in the Olympics. I don't know how to argue it. Another funny thing about Steve is that he not only ordered the badminton court, he then called me and he said he had this new product, it's called Play Impossible, and it's a ball that connects with your phone, and it has all these games and challenges, and it was really cool. He asked me if I'd try it, and said he can only bring one over if I'd post a clip on the internet, which I haven't done, but I will at some point. I said, sure, bring it on over, and then he texted me. He's like, I'll be over in 30 minutes. I texted back saying, thanks, dude. I hope you're not offended. I'm not going to open the door for you. I mean, coronavirus is out there. He gives me the thumbs up text back, and then when he gets there, he knocks on the door and waits. So finally, I open the door. I don't invite him in. He hands me the bag with the ball in it, and I grab his ball bag gently with two fingers I step back and I'm secretly hoping that he leaves as soon as possible so he doesn't give me the disease. I will say the ball is sick, but if me or my family get sick, Steve, I am blaming you. I also need to thank Traeger. They sent over a shit ton of wood pellets and rubs to make sure I was set during this time of staying in and cooking out. But you aren't here to listen to me talk about my eating habits and coronavirus. You're here for a podcast. And a month or so ago, I interviewed Glenn Plake. The plan was for me to chat with Glenn for about an hour, and then I talked to his wife, Kimberly. That didn't happen, as Glenn tends to talk for a long time, and I decided I'd do a whole podcast with Kimberly. I know she's got a great backstory before Glenn, and it'll be interesting to hear her side of things that I've already talked to Glenn about. And really, no one's interviewed Kimberly yet, so I wanted to get her story out there. Before we get into Kimberly and her story... I want to ask you to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to me and ask you to tell a friend about the show or even post about it. That would be rad. And most importantly, I want you to support my amazing sponsors who make the show happen. These are all brands that I've used forever and I really trust. They are Evo, Stanley, Spy Optic, 686, and the 10 Barrel Brewery. Now, let's talk to Kimberly Plague. You guys just came back from Chamonix. I think you were there for like two months. When did you get back to the States? Got back on Sunday night, and Glenn's dad and PK were supposed to pick us up, but we were all very aware of what was going on through immigration and customs, and we didn't want them to have to wait for seven hours for us to clear. So we ended up renting a car and making it home on Monday night because the highway 80 was closed to get home but you were there for the whole thing in europe like when this thing broke out you were there almost for day one in the europe ordeal is that right most definitely and eight miles through the mont blanc tunnel was pretty much the epicenter of where it all started in northern italy and unfortunately some mammoth friends of ours were on a ski trip in the dolomites and 
he's still in intensive care. He's still on a ventilator. They're trying to get his oxygen levels up. They've put him on dialysis. He's been in the hospital for weeks. And he was part of a 10-guy ski trip, and all 10 tested positive, and he's the one that's critically ill. Wow, that's insane. And when are you first aware of it, and is it a big deal in France when you're there? It was definitely a big deal, but not quarantine big deal, as in everyone knew there was a virus going around, but didn't know the severity, didn't know how contagious it was or is. And seriously, it was, okay, Milan's starting to get shut down. It started to work its way to the Aosta Valley, which is the valley just next to the Chamonix Valley. It didn't get locked down like Lombardy and all that until later. But it eventually all happened. But when Italy shut, all of Italy went to all the different ski resorts and started to basically, I guess, infect everyone at the ski area and the ski resort. So all of Italy became contaminated because everyone went on holiday when all the schools started getting shut. and Everyone was quarantined to not go to work, but they didn't have places to go with their kids. So they went skiing. And you have to say that Skiing was kind of a part of it. Did you guys cut your trip short because of the virus, or were you planning on coming back at that point? What happened with us was Glenn's dad and PK were supposed to come to Europe and spend two months with us in Chamonix and in Europe starting March 15th through May 15th. We had been looking forward to it and planning this trip for years and years and years. It was the very first time in Glenn's career that we asked all of the sponsors to give us a little bit of a hiatus between March 15th and May 15th so that we could show his dad and his wife, PK, Europe through our eyes. So we rented them an apartment for two months so that they had a home base real close to us. We got them annual ski passes so that we could ski every day, that the lifts were open and running. And so whenever the whole collapse of the virus came in, we, of course, canceled everything. As you know, none of us are eligible to do anything at any time. And we are inside our 14-day quarantine right now. So we cannot touch or be within 10 feet of anyone. No one can be around us. I'm taking it probably even more seriously than Glenn. It's super important for us to be in the non-contagious stage, which I don't even know if they know the contagious stages. I mean, how do they know that in 14 days I am free of the virus? I don't know. And then, okay, so now I've been 14 days quarantined. And in 14 days, that means that I can go now and be in with 10 people within six feet of each other and kind of be in a little bit of a social arena. But who's to say that they're not going to give it to us? Well, I think it's just giving you a baseline of like, you didn't develop symptoms from your trip in Europe. They're clean after two weeks. And then once you go out, every time you leave the house, I feel like there is a risk of you catching this. That's why it's best to stay home so we don't catch it. But when you go to the airport on the way home, is customs just a nightmare and lines everywhere? Or is it smooth sailing? That's what we had expected. The way we routed our stuff is Glenn is, I don't want to call him a witch, but he had this sixth sense of knowing that we needed to not fly through the Schengen. You know, in that 24 hour period where we had to make a decision, I was like, Glenn, we have a year visa in our passports. We are eligible to stay in Europe for one year straight. Let's take advantage of that. Let's stay here in Europe. Let's go climb mountains. Let's go hike. Let's go ski touring. If the ski area is closed, we can find a way. We can do our road biking because we, you know, have done the Tour de France in France before. You know, I thought, oh, my gosh, this could be a ticket to paradise. Glenn said, well, you know, Schengen's kind of shutting down all around us. France was starting to be put into a little bit of containment. There were rumors that the ski lifts are going to close. Then there was like this opportunity of like, okay, well, if we have to go, 
let's go sometime the next week and we'll go through London and we'll take a train from Bellevue and we'll go into Paris and then we'll take the channel into London and then fly from London. And then Glenn was like, you know what? I don't know. So anyway, this trip came into Expedia and all of a sudden Glenn was like, oh, here's one from Istanbul, from Turkey. And we love flying through Turkey. We love Turkish Airlines. And Glenn was like, let's book this one. It's a thousand bucks. All the other ones were like 6,000 bucks. And we were just like, we're not going to pay that much. So we got the one going from Geneva to Istanbul, 14 hour layover. During that layover, there's a place called the Yotel. You get this little pod that you can sleep in for 14 hours or whatever. So Glenn rented us a little pod and it's one of those international airports that has pretty much every designer in the world, every little boutique, Turkish kiosks everywhere. And it's shopping 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So I settled Glenn into the pod and I go, okay, honey, well, you have a good rest. I'm going out. So I went and walked the mall till like 3.30 in the morning. And then I came in and rested for a few hours. And then we caught our flight from Istanbul to San Francisco. Fortunately for us, the San Francisco flight took off. And when Glenn had booked the flight, literally like 48 hours beforehand, it said, do you want to choose your seat right now? And Glenn was like, yeah, I think I will. So we chose our seats and it was a seat for two on the right-hand side of the plane. One of the seats had been taken away, so he had extra room. When we got on the plane, I sprayed my little antibacterial, and we put scarves and head socks around our faces and necks and everything and kept ourselves pretty covered and flew into San Francisco. And when we landed, we were like, all right, we've landed in the USA. Let's see what it takes to get through customs. So we went, got in line. There was literally like 20 people there. We got in line. The immigration officer, we're totally honest. We said, yep, we've been in the hotbed. Yes, we've been in France and Switzerland. And we had ski toured and and gone down the Marbury. So we had technically been in Italy. Anyway, long story short, we got in line. He took us over to the actual place where they do your monitoring for your coronavirus and all that. And they made us fill out some paperwork. They handed it to us and they said, do you have any symptoms? And we said, no. They said, okay, here's your 14-day self-quarantine instructions. If you have any questions or concerns, call us and we'll go from there. So neither one of us have come down with anything or have any issues. So we are lucky enough to say that we have a clean bill of health at the moment. And we've got another nine days to go. Well, our fingers are crossed for you, like everybody should have their fingers crossed for themselves, too, because who knows who has it and who doesn't. We haven't gotten to that point yet. I mean, you're making all these plans like a week ago. It's not like you were there a month ago or anything. This has all happened in the past few days. But up until the other day, your life revolved around ski resorts and ski areas, and life started totally different than snow for you. Are you a born and raised Texan? Born and raised in Houston, Texas, and my father didn't have any boys. I think they wanted a boy and my name was supposed to be Keith. And so they named me Kimberly. And I guess since that day, my dad said, okay, my girl's going to be my boy. And so I was the kind of girl that watched football and asked for slot car sets whenever I was a kid, had a mini bike, swam every day after school and played tennis with my father till basically the last couple of years of his life. So it wasn't a life of like cotillion cheerleading and all the stereotypical things that pretty girls from Texas do? Well, I have to tell you the truth that I have both sides to the coin. I am heads and I am tails. The head of me is probably the girl who has the painted fingernails that's climbing the tree that's building the tree house, that's working on the little dirt bike and mowing the lawn. So I definitely have all the girl qualities. And I did do the cheerleading for one year. And I did drill team throughout my high school and college years, did the pageant thing, just kind of entered and progressed through that. And I had both worlds and they were both huge. And yeah, 
I'm two people in one. When you think back to it, when high school happens for Glenn, he's drinking, doing drugs, and living a total punk rock lifestyle. What kind of lifestyle are you living? Are you just like a tomboy type daughter that your dad wanted to be a son? No, I definitely was the drill team, girly girl, homecoming, princess court, whatever. But I had all this athletic drive. Maybe the drill team is what continued my pursuit of the athletics, being that, you know, when I went to college, I was on the drill team there at Kilgore College. They like invented it, right? They totally invented it. And for 17 positions, 400 girls try out. It's just the hardest of the hard to even be accepted into the drill team. In my high school, and I didn't have one in college that I know of, but the drill team was usually the girls that couldn't make the cheerleading team. But what is the drill team to Kilgore College? Because is it totally different? Is it another level above cheerleading? Or where would you even place it? Drill team is the halftime performance of a football game. We are more of a precise dance team for the halftime program. You spin a baton pretty well? No, I am not a twirler. I'm not a batonist. I literally am a high kicker. You had to hit the brim of your hat with your leg. We'd jump and go into the splits. It was just a halftime performance, drill team, dance team, world famous. We traveled all over the world performing for Bob Hope, Macy's Thanksgiving Parade, kicked off the Cotton Bowl. So it's a big, big honor. It's a really big honor. Think of the Rockets, but in a... In Texas? In Texas. You know, the Rockets, to me, they only kick to their waist, where we had to kick our hats. That's like twice as far. Twice as far. I mean, it's like doing the splits every time that you kick. One time I kicked my nose so hard that it started bleeding. You'd have to Google it. It's a pretty unique... Oh, I've Googled ...performance it. team. Yeah, I loved them. I'm very proud to say that I am a rangerette forever. Like I said, my dad had no boys. I always wanted to be adventurous. And I learned how to ski when I was a kid through vacations and holidays. We didn't have mountains in Texas. So did you know that Texas has the largest population of snow skiers in the United States of America? I lived in Colorado for a while, and I would guess that just based on a lot of the Texans that would show up there. They stand out a little bit, too. Definitely. <laughs> With their Texas handbags and that kind of thing, <laughs> walking around the ski area. This is so true. So the first time I ever skied was in New Mexico, and it was a small ski area called Powder Puff Mountain in New Mexico. And the third day I was skiing, I had hit some moguls, and I flew up in the air, and I landed on my left leg. And I broke my leg the third day snow skiing ever in my life. And I was right underneath a chairlift and someone's ski fell down and hit me in the head while I was laying there with a broken leg. Oh, no way. Yes, way. Did you get cut? No, I didn't get cut. I just had a concussion, so I had to keep me up all night. <laughs> I had a cast on to the middle of my thigh for the first, I think, six weeks. And then I had a knee cast for another few weeks and then a walking cast. So during the sixth grade, I was the one with the cast on. Well, that sucks. Oh, it didn't matter. I, I didn't care. It's wounds heal, thank God. So that was my first ever introduction to snow skiing. And I just got addicted. And I thought I was a good snow skier. I really, really did. Because I could keep up with the boys so from that moment of my first experience of skiing, I continued to ski all the way through till I met Glenn. So skiing was a part of my annual holiday vacation. Did you work in ski shops too? I did eventually. Yeah, that was just part of who you were, was a skier? Yeah, you know, I water skied, I snow skied. I just love to do activities. So being that I water skied when I was a kid, I snow skied when I was a kid. But I would be really lucky if I got two weeks a year, but, you know, definitely at least a week a year to Colorado or New Mexico. And whenever I went to college, I was in the ski club. I mean, literally, you just evolved right into continuing to be a skier. And then after college, I went up to the East Coast 
first did you do a Miss Texas thing? Was there a beauty pageant where you represented Kilgore? That's correct. I was Miss Kilgore and Miss Greg County. I was in the Miss Texas pageant twice. That just happened naturally. Literally, someone just asked me, hey, would you like to be in the pageant? It's going to be whenever. And I said, sure, I'll try. And so I went and I won and I was eligible to go to the Miss Texas pageant. Then I was a finalist there. So it's just the evolution of it all just kind of happened naturally. And the way I got to the East Coast was I modeled for like seven different agencies after college and I just had work everywhere. It was all commercial print, you know, stuff like with Reebok tennis shoes, Pepsi Cola. Do you make good money doing that? I supported myself for, yeah, years doing that. In a day, can you make a grand or two just being a model? Sure. And then you can make royalties and residuals on commercials for as long as they run them. So I did fine. And I modeled around the world three times. Then it all happened naturally. This is not by any means what I thought or would think that I was going to be doing as an adult. And then I had moved to Westport, Connecticut. And I was driving by this really big building and it said, now hiring. And you know, when you are modeling, you don't work every day. I had plenty of free time and I saw this now hiring and it said ski market. So I walked in the door. I have no idea what caroused me to do that. I assume that skiing and tennis and water skiing and all the sports that I love, ski market would be great. So I walked in the door. And Andy Ferguson, who was the owner's son of the 23 ski markets that were on the East Coast, and Brian Rice, who was his assistant manager or whatever, were opening the store in Norwalk. You know, I introduced myself and I said, do you guys need a fashion merchandiser? And I went ahead and applied and they basically hired me on the spot. So I said, well, as long as my hours can be flexible and whenever I get a call from the agency to go in to the city to do an interview and audition. May I please have some flexible hours? And they were like, sure, no problem. So I did that. And that winter or the second winter of of that, there was an on snow demo day. And my friend who I, of course, met through the ski market, she was 16 years old. She didn't have a car. And she said, all right, Kimberly, there's an on snow demo on Thursday, do you want to go? And I go, yeah, if we're going skiing, for sure I want to go. She goes, well, there's this guy, Glenn Plake, that I want to go meet and he's going to be there. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Well, I want to go skiing. So we got in my car, we drove to Stratton Mountain and went to the demo day and we were the last people on the hill. I was demoing 195 TNCs and When I was up on that deck where they adjust your bindings, I saw this really cute guy walking into the lodge. He had on green overalls with like a white t-shirt underneath it. And he had this long kind of hair blowing back. And he was walking in the lodge and I'm like, wow, that guy's cute. And I just didn't even know who that was. He caught my eye. So anyway, we went and skied the last few runs of the day. And then we had to go in. She wanted a poster from Glenn Plague. And so I was like, well, okay, we'll go get a poster. Lo and behold, the cute guy that I saw walking into the lodge was Glenn. Hmm. And I had no clue. So anyway, we asked him for the poster. She got her poster. We started chit-chatting. And then he had to host the party. So he was up on stage doing his thing and all that. And I was hanging out with all the ski market people. At the end of the party, we were just all kind of hanging out. And he was done with his deal. And he was like, I'm starving. I need to go and have something to eat. And he was like, will you guys join me? And I was like, sure. And so he set up Liz, my little girlfriend, with one of the tech rep guys And then he took us next door to have a bite to eat. And we all hung out. We all laughed and talked and all that. When it came down to the bill, he had a $1,000 check in his wallet, but he didn't have any money and he didn't have a credit card. So I was like, oh, I'll get it. Pay me back someday. I don't care. So I paid for the dinner and stuff. 
And then we went to the car and I literally kissed him goodnight and said, thanks. That was fun. And thought that was really cool. He was a really nice guy and I'm glad we got to meet and hang out and stuff. And that was literally it. And then Liz was like, I'm going to show you a video or whatever of Glenn. And I'm sure I'd kind of seen him because I play him in the ski shops and all that, but I never really paid that much attention. So I found out Glenn had been in Blizzard of Oz at that point in Maltese Flamingo. And so the next night was a inventory for the ski shop. So every employee has to be there. And he had called the ski shop that Friday afternoon. And he asked, is Kim Manuel going to be at work tonight? And they said, yes, she will be here. So he drove my catch up to the airport in a rental car. He stole it and drove it through three states from Massachusetts down to Connecticut and was waiting in the parking lot when I drove up to go to the inventory night. So there's Glenn Plague at the ski shop. I come in, I introduce him to everybody there because not everybody went to the demo day. And so they said, well, Kim, you've got to still work tonight. And so we told him where to go and where to hang out. And all of us came and joined him that night. And we all hung out together till two or three o'clock in the morning. And me being the Texas Southern Baptist girl that I am, I said, okay, you're staying with the boys and I'll pick you up at 7 a.m. and I'll take you to breakfast. So I kissed him goodnight again, and then I went and picked him up for breakfast. We went and had a big breakfast and then showed him the whole area. And that was pretty much it. It all happened naturally, you know, not forced at all. And I think that's kind of how our lives have been, you know. I think just having you on the podcast, I mean, you guys are very similar people where Glenn probably does a lot of the talking when you guys travel, but just having you and you having the platform, it's like talking to the female version of Glenn without the cackle laugh. <laughs> well, yeah, that's probably true a little bit. I mean, I think after you've been with someone more than half your life, maybe two do become one. I don't know. Now it is time for me to take my first sponsor break, and I'm going to start it out with Evo. And if you haven't been to Evo.com, well, that's where it all started. And you can still go there today, even in the face of COVID-19. I do need to let you know that Evo has closed their retail locations until further notice. It's the responsible thing to do for employees and consumers. I wasn't surprised when Bryce decided to be the first retailer that I know of to shut all of his doors while still paying his employees. That's the kind of person that he is. And he built his site, Evo.com, to be the best in class for all things ski, snow, bike, surf, and beyond since it went online in 2001. They carry all the brands, all the products, and all the things that you need to go out on your adventure. And with these challenging times, it's more important than ever to buy whatever else is on your list to keep you entertained while we are distancing. While you're over at Evo.com, check out some of their branded products that are as good or better than the big brand stuff. When you check out, You'll get 20% off of branded gear using the code POWELL20. And Evo offers free shipping on orders over $50, a low price guarantee, and a no-hassle return policy. My next sponsor is 686. They have been the independent outerwear brand in snow since 1992, and they make the best gear on the planet. That's no bullshit. My 686 Glacier Jacket is the best jacket I've ever owned, and it comes with a lifetime guarantee. The whole Glacier series does. And since 686 shipped me a pair of everywhere pants, I've lived in them. They're so comfortable, and like all 686 products, there's so much attention paid to the pocket style and detail. Let's be honest. Times aren't great out there right now for a lot of things. But it happens to be the greatest time ever to get your hands on some 686 outerwear. Starting today at 686.com is the sale of all sales. So head on over to the website and get 40% off all Gore-Tex styles and most apparel site-wide. My final sponsor during this break is Stanley, the brand that has been a leader in keeping things hot and cold for over 100 years. They invented the vacuum bottle, and you've seen it so many times in your life. You know, that green bottle that kept your grandpa and your dad's coffee hot all day long? Well, Stanley still makes a bottle like that, 
now in a bunch of colors, and they work better than whatever you're using right now. The reason Stanley is the leader in hot and cold is because their product is better. I mean, they created the category and they keep innovating. But Stanley makes so much more than that iconic bottle. I personally use the water bottles and pint glasses daily, and my drinks stay hotter or colder than yours by at least an hour. You deserve that same quality. Now you can get 30% off all Stanley products by heading to their site, stanley-pmi.com, entering the code POWELL and the number 30, all one word, and boom, it's that easy. Those are some of my great sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. Were you guys inseparable from the beginning? Like after that trip and you're in Connecticut, does he find a way to get back and spend a ton of time for you? And is it love at first sight? We're not going to leave each other's side from the beginning? Because that's kind of how it seems now is you guys are inseparable. <laughs> well, there are times of separation, but we'll get to that later. But I have to tell you that, you know, I wasn't looking for him and he wasn't looking for me. He had relationships. I had a relationship. I mean, we just kind of weren't in that space during that particular time. But I think we gravitated to each other so quickly. And I hear him say whenever he's speaking about me that he was curious about me. I was different or whatever. And for me, he just seemed like a really nice guy with a really big heart and was super cute and had this athletic ability that I was just, wow, and mesmerizing and in awe of. And our two worlds were kind of meant like gears just coming together. It was really cool. So after we had met, we had made a date, like on December 12th. That's the first time that I have available to be free. Can we meet in Jackson Hole? And I was like, you know what, Glenn? I'll cash in my miles and I'll get to Jackson Hole. And he goes, okay, cool. We'll meet there. No matter what, on December 12th, we're going to meet in Jackson Hole. I was like, sweet, fine. So I never spoke to him again after that moment of making that decision. So his dad called me and left me a voice message and said, hey, Glenn wants you to fly into Reno because Jackson's not going to open because they don't have any snow. So fly into Reno. And I said, okay, I'll change my flight to Reno and I'll be there. And so Glenn was out working and running around the country or the world or wherever. And so the only contact I had between the time that we'd made that date to that time was his dad saying, change the flight. So I changed the flight to Reno. I landed in Reno and he wasn't there. <laughs> huh. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've flown from New York to Reno. I've got my bags. I'm out on the curb. I was like, oh boy. And then I, I think it was only like 20 minutes. And he pulls up in this red Scirocco and there's a rose on the seat. And there is a four pack of black cherry wine coolers in the back seat. That was my favorite. Anything cherry is my favorite. Of course, now we don't do any alcohol. So of course, there's no more black cherry wine coolers. But at the time, it was appropriate because I was over 21. I'm not going to tell you anything else about that. Anyway, I jumped in the car and then we started skiing together and we ended up in Mammoth. What was supposed to be a three-day weekend ended up being a week. Then it ends up being Christmas holiday. So I fly directly from Reno to Houston. And then all of a sudden it's going to be New Year's. And now we're liking each other. Now we're like talking and hanging out and it's going to be a relationship. What do your parents think of this guy who's got a mohawk and looks crazy and already has probably 20 felonies on his record and is just a wild guy? What do they think when their beauty queen brings him home? To tell you the truth, I preempted my mom and I showed her some pictures of him in the magazines. And I said, he's got this persona of this bad boy. He's got a mohawk. I said, it's just a haircut. It's just a hairstyle. And my mom said, all right, Kim, what is so different about this boy than one of the boys that you've dated before? And I said, mom, he's got a big heart. And she was like, well, I can't argue with that. So when my parents met him was New Year's Eve night, 1989. 
The reason I know that is because he flew in that day. I picked him up from the airport. We went to my cousin's place. We put up his mohawk. We dyed his mohawk blue. And he had a bright blue mohawk and met my whole entire family at the Houston Oiler football game versus the Pittsburgh Steelers for the playoff game. That was that night. So they thought he was the ultimate fan, you know, having the big mohawk. And so he met all my mom's best friends. We hung out at Astro World, which is now Six Flags. And the reason he came to Texas was because Houston had won against the Green Bay Packers. Glenn was sponsored by Saranac Gloves at the time. And Fabre was one of the chairmen for the Green Bay Packers. And so if they were to win, I would have flown to Green Bay to watch the playoff game. But the Houston Oilers won. So Glenn came to Houston, which in hindsight was great because he got to meet my whole family and got to hang out with us in Texas and kind of meet that whole scene, that whole side. So I think they may have slowly fell in love with the Glenn that I was falling in love with and saw the genuine nice guy that I fell in love with and now have a a big, beautiful life with. You guys got married pretty quickly. I mean, after a couple years of dating, I think it's like 91. How does Glenn propose to you? (laughs) I was hoping you'd ask me that question. Because I don't know if this has ever been discussed, but Glenn was sponsored by Rip Curl. So we were traveling from Australia back to America together. He had done a photo shoot in New Zealand, and then we were on the plane. And back then, we could get upgraded real easily. So we got upgraded, and he got down on a knee in the aisle in first class and asked me to marry him. And the lady brought over champagne and he had his grandma's engagement ring or one of the rings that his great uncle had left him from his grandma. And so it just was the cutest, most beautiful little story of how he asked me to marry him. And I said, yes. And so that next year, when we went to Australia, both of us got our wedding outfits from Australia, from the designers there. Glenn bought like a Hugo Boss dark green, forest green, cashmere double-breasted jacket to wear, and then a Tina Varagos silk vest underneath, and then a beautiful ascot and silk shirt underneath that. And then I had a Tina Varagos double-breasted silk mini skirt suit. It had Belgian lace and all beaded and pearled and stuff. But anyway, he proposed to me on the airplane. And our life is on an airplane. You know, if we're home 60 days a year, that's a lot. That's crazy. It's funny, though, to hear you describe the dresses and the clothing that you have, and you're so into it. And then a honeymoon, you would think maybe you guys would go to Bali or somewhere crazy. You spend it in a motorhome, and you start the down-home tour that year. So when Glenn pitches something like that to you, I would think before we did this interview that you might think it was crazy, but you're really just Glenn in a female version. So. I'm sure you were like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go to as many places as we can. Well, I tell you what, to this day, I don't even think I've ever had a honeymoon. So I guess I'm living my life daily on a honeymoon because just the way we roll. I don't know if I knew what we were doing, but I knew where we were going and what we were doing involved skiing every day. When we moved me from New York to California, Via Texas, we stopped in North Carolina and skied at one of the little ski areas that he had known about through his travels in Europe. And so that kind of opened his eyes to that little mom and pop ski areas and how the heart and soul of skiing is there and how they show up every day and how dedicated and committed they are to the sport that we love and we cherish. And, you know, we've been given this life of being able to ski and inspire others to go out and ski. And it was just our way of saying thank you and not just being this person you see on TV or on the video. He's a real person and every person that he meets, he touches, he sees, he talks to, he's very attainable and he's very approachable. And I mean, he will sit somewhere And until the last person leaves, he won't leave. Until the last person has their signed autograph or whatever, 
we could be down at the lake, we could be wherever. This is going to be a hard thing going through all this little self quarantine stuff. <laughs> but he's very social and he's very in the moment. You know, the person that's in front of him is the most important person to him at that time. I mean, what a great quality. I mean, that just does show you how big of a heart he really has. And he remembers how, everyone's name. Oh, dear God. There's not many pros like him by any means. But you guys are married. You're a young couple. Was there a plan for Little Plakes or was that something you didn't even think about? Oh, dude. So we didn't really think about it for a while. And then we built this house that I'm actually in right now. And it was just kind of the evolution of marriage, of being together. And we were like, you know what? It's probably time for us. Why don't we have a couple of kids? You know, we have a house. We're stable. Why don't we share it with a couple kids or whatever? So we go down the road of, all right, let's do this. So I kind of get a little serious about it. Me with anything, I'm kind of like Glenn. I'm kind of like all or nothing. Put it all out there. So, I mean, I, I kind of got serious about it. Like looking at the calendar and being like this day, this hour? Like in the first month of trying to get pregnant. So I was like, well, if we're going to do this, I better figure it all out and see what we need to do and all that. So anyway, that first month, I got pregnant. Just Glenn looked at me and I got pregnant. And it was just <laughs> like, wow. I mean, my parents were on their anniversary over in Europe golfing. And I didn't know how to get a hold of them to tell them, hey, I'm pregnant. You're going to be grandparents, you know, that whole thing. Because I was super, super excited and couldn't believe it. Finally, everything comes around and I go to my first doctor's appointment and I was all stoked. And I waited a long time. There was no rush to go to the doctor. Nowadays, you don't wait this long, but I went at about 12 weeks and unfortunately, all I had was a pregnancy sack. Oh, sorry. The fetus had passed away. And so unfortunately, that first time I had to have a DNC because it didn't exterminate on its own. It didn't leave me. So it didn't miscarriage on its own. So I did that. And so the doctor said, okay, you've been pregnant for three months. So now you need to cleanse for three months and then you can try again. And I was like, okay, cool. That's going to be great. No big deal. So after three months, I was kind of like on my routine again. I'm like, okay, well, yeah, maybe this month. Okay. So I get pregnant again. And seriously, this goes on for seven pregnancies. Pregnant for three months, cleansed for three months, pregnant for three months, cleansed for three months, seven times. Are you a mess mentally? <laughs> it's got to be so disappointing every time that happens. Well, I have to tell you the truth. You know, I became a Christian when I was seven years old and I... I have had eternal peace and surrender in my life since that day. I mean, yes, it's sad. Yes, I have seven angels up in heaven above. I truly believe that. And I do believe that things happen for a reason. And after the seventh one, I 100% surrendered. I was like, okay, Glenn, I cannot do this anymore to my body, to my mind, to my health, to my well-being. You know, after like number five, honestly, I thought, okay, this is number five. This one is going to be it. This one, we're going to have a baby and it's going to be healthy and alive. Da, da, da. And then I had the miscarriage. That's the only like weirdness of it all is it's just like, oh my gosh, really? Again? No, I just can't be happening. And so I never, ever had to have a DNC again. Everything happened naturally. So, I mean, that was kind of good. That's like a record. I don't know records on there. Well, I've never heard of anyone else having that many consecutive ones. The Stanford University professor of fertility, he looked me dead in the eyes and he said, Kim and Glenn, I'm just going to tell you, you're both healthy. You have healthy eggs. He has his healthy sperm. And something happens when it gets together and it doesn't form correctly. He told us, he goes, okay. You are not a fertility candidate. You are both very, very fertile. So he just was like, you just got to keep doing what you're doing. So we did. And I did it for seven times. That's enough. Yeah. I said, I have to surrender. And Glenn was 100% into surrendering with me. And we never went down the adoption road because it wouldn't be us. And 
we give like we are parents or aunt and uncle to the world. And so I don't know if we could do and give as much as we do if we had children. I kind of hate to say that, and I hope you understand. I don't think an adopted kid could handle being in the plaques. You have to have plague <laughs> blood running through you to be able to, to handle being in that family. That might be true. But I mean, I do consider myself as a very parental person, as in I have a niece and a nephew. I'm so thankful and grateful for them. And I love them so much like they're my own. And I want them to be with us whenever we can and whenever they can. It's just good. We have a great opportunity. We are given the freedom, I guess, to be able to help the world and help people who need it when they need it. So we're eligible to be out there. Okay. Well, I'm going to fast forward to a time when Glenn wasn't available. It's 1992. Glenn's in Jackson Hole. He's passed his drug phase. I don't think he was with you when he was doing those kind of things, but he was drinking and partying when he was with you. And he gets hammered in Jackson. Something happens. He wakes up in the morning charged with three felonies. When do you hear about this or how do you hear about it? Oh, this is a long story, and I hope you're ready. Okay. Glenn was on the ABC Wide World of Sports production. He was being filmed for the TV show, and they were in Jackson Hole. They had gone out heli skiing for one of the skiing segments, and they came back to the patrol room, and in the patrol room, they had these shots which were called test tube babies and they were inside the freezer at the patrol shack so i guess they all partied and were hanging out till pretty late glenn and i had a dinner date with the production crew that evening and he was pretty much not able to be found but i finally found him and he was with a whole bunch of the guys, and they were all just partying and hanging out. And I had gone up to the dinner, and I had said, I'm going to go and see if I can find him, and I'll, I'll be back. And before then, I was like, well, I know Glenn will have been drinking, and he will be pretty messed up. Yeah. So I had to catch up. So I had a couple of Long Island iced teas real quick so that I could catch up and not be like this sober wife. So you party too. Yeah, I did. So I caught up with him on that level and went and I found him. And all he could say to me was, I'm so hungry. I'm starving. I don't want to go to a fancy restaurant. I don't want to go to dinner. I just want a burger. So I'm like, well, okay, well, we'll go get you a burger. And then we'll just go and say hello to the crew and good night. And you'll see him in the morning. So he was like, all right. But obviously he was not happy that I hunted him down and taking him out of his voice thing. And so we took him down and it was some sort of underground burger place. And I was pretty angry. And I was just like, Glenn, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I was just having fun. I'm just having a good night and hanging out with the boys and all that stuff. And he got really mad and he just kind of got angry. And I remembered a burger coming at me and kind of like being smeared in my hair. Whoa. Kind of like a little bit aggressive, but not bad. But I was just like, whoa, that just happened? You're married to this guy. Yeah, only a year. So now I'm at the point of where, okay, I'm the one that's storming off and going back to the hotel room and locking myself in the hotel room and calling my sister and just going, dude, I can't believe what just happened. And I don't know how much more I can take of this. And you have to understand, in our world, even to this day, skiing is most everyone's vacation, holiday, time off. Après ski is important. Parting is important. You know, having fun. And that's every day, every single day. Every single day. We are the ambassadors. That's our work. This is our job. Everybody wants to buy you a beer. Everyone wants to buy us a beer. Everyone wants to be in our lives and part of our social and skiing world and all that. So we are working and living in everyone else's vacation. So then we became part of that vacation. So we were partying all night long, then skiing all day long, then partying all night long, skiing all night. You know, and so it just became that vicious snowball effect. 
I mean, literally think of a snowball rolling down the hill and catching every snowflake along the way. And it was just spinning out of control and just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is just where the snowball hits the bank and just explodes. It's that for it's a burger in your face being smeared on you. Yeah, the burger in the hair. I'm to the hotel room, locked myself in, calling and crying on the phone going, I don't think I can live this way anymore. I'm done. I can't do it. It's beyond my control at this point. And I literally had almost resolved to like, okay, that's it. It's over. I'm done. It was really that bad. It's time for my final sponsor break. And the first brand I'm going to talk about is Spy Optic. Based out of Southern California, Spy is the intersection of style, party, and technology. They have been developing the best sunglasses and goggles for snow, surf, wake, moto, and so much more forever. And the products really are better. Nothing on the market compares to the happy definition lens technology that Spy has. While I'd say go to the store and try a pair of sunglasses on and see how much better the happy lens is, how much better the fit is, and how much better you look compared to what you're currently wearing, you can't do that. What you can do is head on over to spyoptic.com, find a pair of sunglasses that you like, and when you check out, use the code POWELL20, that's all one word, to save 20% on glasses that I hope you use to get outside during this time of social distancing. My final sponsor is the Ten Barrel Brewery, and they have been brewing beer out of Bend, Oregon since 2006. And since they started brewing beer, they are committed to skiing, snowboarding, biking, and drinking beer outside. While I see a lot of copycat brands out there lately trying to mimic what Ten Barrel is doing in the outdoor space, no one puts their money where their mouth is like Ten Barrel. This year, they produced both a ski and a snowboard movie. The ski movie is Watch This featuring Lucas Walks, and then they have Hold My Beer, a snowboard movie featuring Curtis Cizik. And the plan was for Ten Barrel to throw three hella big air events where they give away a ton of money and throw a huge party for everybody in attendance. Unfortunately, the final two events at Mount Bachelor and Mount Hood Meadows will be canceled. The good news is that even with all that we're going through, you can still drink beer outside. Next time you're at the store, pick up a six-pack of Profuse Juice, a hazy IPA that I'm loving right now, and a beer that gives 1% of sales back to the Surfrider Foundation. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. At like 2.30 in the morning, I get this frantic knock on the door and it's like, let me in, Kimberly, Kim, Kim, let, let me in, let me in, Kimberly, Kimberly, let me in. There's been an accident. And I'm like, oh my God. And so it took me like five minutes to open the door because I was like so mad. I'm like, no, go away. You know, nah, nah. and there's like, no, let me in, let me in. No, go away. It was like, I've been hurt, you know, whatever or whatever. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So I open the door and there he is and he's like a bloody mess and he's like crazy. And I'm like, oh my God, what's happened? And so there was a bar fight and beer bottles went this way, ashtrays went that way. And there was just a huge bar fight. So he jumped in the shower and he had had his mohawk up. So he jumped in the shower real quick and got all cleaned up. And he was like, I think I'm in trouble or whatever. And I'm going to go, I, yeah, I bet. So anyway, about half an hour later, the cops knock on the door of the hotel room and they take him away. They handcuff him and they take him away. So now he is in jail. He is in custody. And he's got, I can't even remember what all he was convicted of, but it was felonies and misdemeanors and attempted murder, whatever it is, you know, attempted with a deadly weapon because it was a beer bottle and ashtrays and someone's getting their nine stitches on their head. And, you know, anyway, it all comes to a head that night. So he gets put in jail. And so my duty is to call the production director, producers, and all those involved to tell them that their star will not be showing up for that day of shooting. And they said, okay, well, will he be available for the next few days? And I go, I can't tell you that yet. So I get on the phone, I pull together Glenn's dad and I said, okay, what do we need to do? We have to hire an attorney. We have to bail him out of jail, all the logistics of doing that. And I think I get him out at around 3.30 or 4 that afternoon. I get him out and we go to dinner and we sit there and we look at each other point blank, face to face. And we go, we either have to stop or we have to get a divorce. 
something's got to drastically happen. And I go, I know, and I'm in it if you're in it. And he goes, I'm in it. And so that night and to this day, we've never touched a drop of alcohol or drugs or anything, nothing. Been clean and sober and as pure as the driven snow since that day. I think it was December the 18th, 1992. So that day, that moment, that whole episode, that whole chapter of our lives changed our lives forever. So it was a good thing, even though it was a terrible night. It was a terrible night, but it was a good thing overall. It was a really, really, really good thing. And it was a good lesson learned. Another big part of your guys' life is going to Chamonix. I mean, I think you guys have started doing that in the 90s and have been going ever since. Do you guys both speak fluent French? Glenn is really fluent. I'm a pretend fluent. I did three weeks of an immersion class in Chamonix, four hours a day, every day. So je today the français, tous les jours, trois semaines, quatre per jour, intensive, integration, the whole thing. So je dors français, je parle vous très bien, but c'est la tête, c'est fatigué. So sometimes I can think about it, sometimes I can't. You know, it just depends on the day, depends on the journée. And je dors français, and, and j'espère de parler vous français tout le temps. Je habite en France, je parle français. So it's a super, super funny thing, and I really, really try. And when I'm immersed, I'm pretty good. But Glenn's extraordinary. I mean, the guy can, he's like a genius. He can figure out anything. He can do anything. Like right now, he's down rednecking down in the shop right now and masterminding tea cases and opening them up and putting new drive shaft. I don't know. You have spoken another language to me for the past four minutes, but that's okay. <laughs> so what people don't know about you is that mm -hmm. you're a great skier as well. Like when you met Glenn, you were super into it and you could ski with all the boys, but you probably weren't even close to where you are now. And you go to Chamonix a lot. When you ski over there, are you getting roped up and doing gnarly shit? I love my skiing in Chamonix. There is nothing like it in the world. The access to the big mountains and to the skiing over there is like none other. And it continues throughout the season and into the summer. We were climbing the Mont Blanc in May. We're skiing steep couars in July. So, yes, my skiing has evolved. Yes, I thought I was a good skier years ago. And in 1990, Glenn started working on my technique back then when neither one of us were ski instructors. And I had bad habits and I started to try to change them. And then I think really what changed my skiing for me was I took six years and totally dedicated those years to being a good mogul skier. Literally, three or four hours a day, getting on chair three at Mammoth Mountain and skiing the face, skiing West Bowl, skiing Climax underneath the gondola. I mean, just literally like focusing on getting my feet, my body separation, my shoulders down the hill and getting those quick feet moving. And so that really, really evolved me as a skier. You know, it's so funny. Glenn would take me in the backcountry here in the Sierras. And so I was pretty prepared to do that kind of thing in Chamonix. But, you know, of course, time and experience allows you to do bigger, better things throughout your whole experience of skiing. I definitely love going out into the big mountains and discovering new kuars, new places, climbing, roping, belaying. How often do you scare yourself over there? I don't scare myself ever. Okay. No. I ski where I know I can ski. I wait for the conditions to be right. No, no, I do not scare myself. I know how to self-rescue. I know how to ask for a rope if I need a rope. No, you're just always prepared, I think, is more than being scared. If you're scared, you shouldn't be where you are. I think you should go into something knowing that if I have to sidestep a few to make that first turn, I'm okay with that. I would rather ski it instead of sidestep it, but 
if the conditions are rock hard, icy, and I need to ice axe in one of my hands, in my uphill hand, then that's where the ice axe is going to be. You know, I'm not going to risk myself in a situation. But anyway, so yeah, no, I love the experience in Chamonix. I love what I've learned. In Chamonix, do you ever see Seth Morrison? I've seen him a couple of times, but not a lot. I don't know what he's doing these days. No one does. I haven't seen him lately. I know he's got a house in Colorado that it's remote. Off the grid, yeah. Yeah, and we bought our property in May of 92 and have been out here in Nevada since then. And we've been off the grid since then. But you wouldn't know it walking into our house. Huh. And then with those Chamonix days, Glenn and yourself, your ski mountaineers and his persona from the impact of the movies that he was in in the late 80s and early 90s, that always made him the extreme dude and it pigeonholed him. And he was never marketed as anything more than that, at least during his K2 days. Did that bother you guys? Because he was doing something that he wasn't marketed as and I think he wanted to be. You know, I think the definition for extreme is different in everybody's definition. And he did the Bonatti Kuar last week. He was with Joe Valone up in La Grave area the week before that. I mean, the man is still putting it way out there and is doing some very great historic extreme lines, whatever. I mean, he's a badass for sure. Yes. I mean, he came in to this whole arena through mogul skiing. I mean, Mike Hatcher was on the chairlift with him during those days and was like, why is this guy wearing 223s on a mogul field? I mean, or whatever, you know? So I think that Glenn skiing is so diversified and so complex. And yes, the pigeonhole was there. And yes, he is an extreme dude. I mean, he is all or nothing. He is the quintessential, you know, he's on an expedition for 30 days. I do not hear from the man for 30 days. I mean, he is all or nothing. I'm like, go do your thing. Go be up in the mountains. Go to the Himalayas. Go to Peru. Go to Chile. Go do your mountaineering, mountain climbing, mountain guiding. But when he goes there and he does that, he's like a badass mountaineer. But then he comes Mm -hmm. back and a sponsor wants to work with him. And all they care about is having the Mohawk up on Wednesday for the photo shoot. Yeah, I mean, the guy is known for his haircut, but I have to say that that haircut also comes with a pair of legs. And when his mohawk is up, it's basically like him swinging a pair of skis over his shoulders. So anyone who is in the ski world or whatever, you know, when you see the mohawk up, you think skiing. And that's his whole world is for everyone to think of skiing and be a skier and love skiing as much as we do. So the Mohawk thing is okay and it's fine, but it's not all that he is about. And I don't think he's ever thought he has to prove himself because he knows what he does and yeah, he's fine with it. So he's just like, whatever they want to do is fine with me. And if they think that they have to tell everybody that I've got a Mohawk, then I've got a Mohawk, whatever. And he does. It's got purple ends right now. <laughs> <laughs> and with K2, I worked with you guys back then. Yes. And it was the perfect sponsor athlete relationship. Glenn was all about America, Jesus, and apple pie. It seemed like he'd sign a lot on different posters with skiing as well. And they lined up really well. But at one point, Glenn wasn't on the K2 anymore. They weren't offering Glenn a contract. What was going on over in your camp when you found out he wasn't going to be on K2? Was it kind of first, like, what? Are you kidding me? So the true story is his contract lapsed, as in the date on the contract was over. Okay. To continue that story is we had friends that we knew, Clint Lyon, who had been a sponsor of Glenn since his very first Reikley ski boot days. And Clint Lyon was being approached by Elon Skies. Elon Skies had a new president. They wanted to go down the road of reintroducing Elon into America. And they wanted an ambassador that would be able to be that man. Well, K2 had gone down the road of moving their factory, their actual manufacturing of the skis to China. That was in like 2000. 
And Glenn was very, very, very upset when that happened because Glenn's a purist. You have to remember the factory was in Vashon. That was K2. That was hand built. You know, every single person that I'm sure has seen Glenn or met Glenn or handshaked him or had a poster where they're working on building those skis, you know, he was very overcome by the fact that those were American branded skis that were being made in China. So that whole time period was really strange for us. And then he was really having a hard time getting over that and not by anybody's fault, but the timing was right. And they said, Glenn, we want to launch you as our brand ambassador and we're going to have you develop some freestyle skis, some backcountry skis, some all mountain skis. We want you to be integrated into our building of our skis. That's the thing with K2 too. Glenn wasn't involved in any of that stuff. You guys would show up for photo shoots and it was high fives and everybody was happy to be together. But it wasn't like Glenn was flying out to test prototypes or anything like that. Because at that point, he would want to build a pair of 212s. Right. Well, he had the extreme skis and he had the mogul skis and he had all the different skis that he needed and wanted. And we did a lot of different Japanese skis that were, you know, uh, totally custom made and had the top sheets for him with that. And we went down that road, but he always loved that they were made in America, loved that they were made in the factory there in Washington and loved every part of that. And when they took that away, it was like they took part of his heart away. I mean, it was literally like being deceived or something. I don't understand it, but it's just how he felt. And and it was just the timing was right. It was really trying times. I remember sitting on the side of the road consoling each other on what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? What is going to happen? And it was just like, well, it's not the same. It's not the same anymore. And I said, well, then start over, be fresh and start pure again, you know, and he was fine with it. He loved it. And now we have one of the best skis on the market right now, the Ripstick Collection. It's hard to beat a ski that it's as light and as fun and as responsive and has all the technical aspects in it with the carbon tubes and the twisted tip. And it's a fun, playful ski. And what else do you want? And it all comes full circle because the old boss at K2, Jeff Machura, comes over to Elon and you guys are all working together. But at this point, Kimberly, we've been going for a while. And I have something called inappropriate questions that I like to end all my podcasts with. With Glenn, I reached out to Brad Holmes. You know Brad Holmes as well, I would think. Oh, do I know him? I love him. Well, I reached out to him again today. Unfortunately, Brad is sick, and he doesn't know what he has. He doesn't think it's the coronavirus. But if I were sick right now, I wouldn't think it was a coronavirus until I had the test. Actually, if I was sick right now, I'd be like, I'm going to die. I have the coronavirus. But that's me. But Brad came up with three inappropriate questions for you. So hold on. Okay. You feeling better? Yeah, you know, just I definitely have like a cough and sketchy times to be sick, you know? Yeah, totally scary. (laughs) But uh, yeah, I'm coming out of it, I think. You know, I don't know what it is. I don't know if I have corona or if I just have a cold, you know? Yeah. No fever, but how are you doing, man? I'm good, man. You know, in the same kind of boat as everybody, just kind of stuck in the house wondering what's going to happen next. No doubt. Fucking crazy times out there. Dude, totally. And you were in Alaska before this, right? Yeah, I was just up in Alaska for three weeks filming for Warren Miller at Points North. Yeah, pretty amazing place. Did it all get shut down while you were there? I don't know if it's shut down right now. I think they're still kind of going, but maybe it is. I don't I don't know. I haven't heard anything like that. I was up there for 19 days and I only got out 3 times actually. It's crazy how that works, man. Yeah, Alaska, but you know, I wouldn't take it back and just shooting stuff around there, eagles and otters and mountains. And it was still an amazing trip. And we still got some good stuff too, you know? Nice. Well, are we going to podcast ever? I always get you asking inappropriate questions for the Plake family, but we should do one one of these days. Yeah, for sure, man. You're going to be stuck home, I would think, for a while. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely trying to abide by the rules. California's on full lockdown. And, you know, I'm trying to stay home for a couple of weeks. But, you know, it's really tough here. We have really, really good snow for the first time in a long time. 
You get seven feet once the mountain shuts down? I think it was like six feet, but it could be seven. I don't know. I haven't been out there because I've been on self-quarantine, but everyone's saying it's too deep, you know? So that's kind of crazy. And do you live alone? No, I live with my wife. Okay. Yeah, I'm married. So it's not totally, totally boring in your world? No, although I'm sleeping in my guest room because I don't want to get her sick, you know? Right. I, I really don't think I have the corona, but who knows, man? Yeah. <laughs> I was definitely in the hot zone, man. I was in Seattle, got laid over there, spent the night. It's definitely crazy. But I don't know if I really have any inappropriate stuff for Kimberly, but I got some questions, and I'm sure we're going to overlap on some stuff. Okay. Well, why don't you fire away with question number one? Kimberly, I know that it's hard traveling with Plake, and he can suck the air out of the room. But what's the gnarliest thing you've ever skied? And tell us about the time that you broke your leg. Well, the gnarliest thing I've ever skied. I would have to say that the most complicated and the coolest ski that I can remember is the north face of the Mont Blanc. I mean, it took such dedication, commitment, and weeks of preparation. I had looked at it, of course, my whole life, looking at the Mont Blanc in the middle of the Chamonix and going, someday I want to be on the top of that. So I prepared by going up the Aguida Medi and hiking all the stairs, staying at, you know, altitude and then having to climb. It's called the Trois Monts, which means you have to climb three mountains to get to the summit. So we prepared by skiing those three, the Tacul, the Modi, and then eventually getting to the summit of the Mont Blanc and did it in a day. You know, it took like, I think, 10 hours or something like that to actually climb and ski. So now I can look from town and go, there's the Mont Blanc, and I've summited it, and I've skied it, and I look at it every day out my window. And you ask 90% of the people around town, and really, not many people have done it. It's pretty crazy. You'd think that, like, everybody's been there, but it takes quite the expedition style of training, and it's nothing to laugh about. It's a really cool, serious climb and ski. I loved it. It was great. It was very memorable, for sure. And I think that Brad Holmes is talking about when I broke my leg off the top of the Aguita Medi. We had walked down the Arete, and it was a gray day, and it had snowed. And so there were some wind lips. And so there's a traverse underneath the Cosmic Arete, the Arete's Cosmic. So as you're traversing across, you're actually, you know, headed over to the Cosmic Couar, which is, you know, one of the classic Chamonix skis and as we were traversing over I was in a pair of test boots and they were two sizes too big and I had them unbuckled and I hit a wind lip in the middle of the traverse and one of my skis tipped down and hit the snow then I fell on top of it and with the backpack and everything so basically I broke my leg in the middle of the mirror de glace or that area so I had to be helicoptered out and I was going over to ski the Cosmic Core for the first time in my life. So I was pretty bummed that that was taken away from me. But I've since skied it a dozen times or whatever. So it's no big deal. All right. I'm going to go with question number two. Kimberly, tell us the technique for spiking Glenn's Mohawk and the strangest place you've ever had to do it. Go into depth about Knox Gelatin and some of the other stuff that failed before that that you tried to use. All right. Where's the weirdest place you've ever put the hawk up? On the floor next to the toilet. Gross. Yeah, super gross. But there was no other option. The only blow dryer was in the bathroom. It was in a lodge, so it wasn't that bad or that contaminated and gross, but it's on the bathroom floor. So yeah, that would be the worst one. Yeah, you put his hair in poop and pee. And who knows what else? (laughs) No, no, it was actually on the floor next to the toilet. Yep, poop and pee. It's all there. It's all there. It's got to be. Somehow or another, there's probably been splashes of it on the floor before. But the recipe is in a spray bottle. And you want to make sure that the spray bottle has a large diameter tube going through its sprayer. And you want to put about a cup of hot water and two sachets of gelatin, Knox gelatin which are the granulated crystal gelatin, and it's no flavor, no color, no sugar gelatin, so the pure gelatin. And we combine those two into the spray bottle, 
shake it all up till it's nice and mixed up and it's going to foam up and blow up all over you. So you got to cover it and then let it settle down to where it looks like a syrup and then put the sprayer back on to the top of the bottle, comb his hair out into the actual shape of the mohawk, spray it from the roots outwards. So you have more on the roots than you have on the tips, blow dry it till it's dry, flip it over like a pancake, do the same blow dry it till it's dry and then stand it up in a mirror. And I actually have to hold with both my hands, the Mohawk up and then Glenn gets the blow dryer and kind of reinforces that it's drying. And then we coat it with rave mega hold. So like a spray, not an aerosol spray, but the pump spray hairspray. Okay. That's how we finish it. And then hot water dissolves it. I guess the funny thing would be also that he has to sleep across the bed or at the foot of the bed because if you have an 18-inch mohawk, you don't want it hitting the pillows or the headboard. So you kind of have to be displaced inside the bed when you sleep at night. And it can stay up for about three days. After about three days, his head kind of gets itchy and scratchy and stuff. And so it just goes down with hot water. So it's biodegradable. It's good for the environment. All right. Well, that's probably the only thing you guys do that's good for the environment. We're going to go with his last inappropriate question. Here we go. Kimberly never, she's done some gnarly stuff, you know? No one ever talks about it because it's all Glenn this, Glenn that. You know, she's come so far as a skier herself and skiing all these years. And, and you know, I just wanted to know what she's most proud of with her skiing and her ability. All right. So not inappropriate at all. But what are you most proud of with your ski career? Oh, man. That now I have the ability and the access to technically be able to share it with other people and legitimately know how to dissect it down and help someone else be a better skier. What other gift can you give to somebody is the gift of skiing. And that's kind of my goal in life is to help everybody have a better ski day so that we can all live as one. (laughs) That seems to be the mantra of the Plakes. And really, I've interviewed Glenn a ton of times. I think the difference between you two is Glenn has more ski fans. You're way better looking, but you guys are pretty much the same person. It's like hearing the answers and even the cadence in the way you speak. It's like you guys are made for each other, which is pretty amazing. And Glenn doesn't happen without you. You don't happen without Glenn. And I'm glad you guys were able to resolve whatever was going on after that bar fight in 92 to stay together because you guys are both amazing people and you pretty much are the same person to me. And I mean that in the best possible way. Thank you, Mike. It was a real pleasure to open up to you. And I hope that I've given you an insight into who I am and what I like to do and who I like to share it with. And thank you so much for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. So that was time with Kimberly Plake, and just like when I talk with Glenn, it's tough to get a word in. I wonder what their conversations are like, because both of them can talk a lot, and it's a great thing. Another great thing is what you learn when you do a podcast like this. Most people would assume that Kimberly met Glenn, and while she may have skied, she didn't really become a skier until she joined Team Plake. But the truth is that Kimberly Manuel was already a skier when she bagged the most famous one of them all. And now she's a badass skier, instructor, and the right-hand woman to the greatest ambassador of skiing that there ever has been, Glenn Plake. At this point, I want to thank you for listening, and I want to ask you to do a huge favor for me. I want you to rate me on iTunes. If you have an iPhone, all you need to do is click the podcast icon, search for the Powell Movement, click my logo, scroll down to where you see the stars, tap five stars, and you're done. It takes about 45 seconds, and the one thing we all have in our hands right now is time, so please do that for me. You can also email me with any questions or concerns that you have. My email is mike at the Powell Movement, and I will get back to you. Finally, I need to thank my sponsors who make the show happen. They are Evo, 686, Spy Optic, Stanley, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Be safe, wash your hands, don't get sick, and have a great week, everyone.